This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Tick Ticks. Buying tickets shouldn't be anonymous. We are built for fans, by fans. Available on Android and iOS. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. This is Dan, and I'm here with Matt, and we're back. It's been a while. It's June 10th, and we're right in the middle of the Stanley Cup Finals, but we're back to talk Flames hockey and, most importantly, talk about the entry draft. Matt, how's your summer going so far? It's getting there. It's good. Not so good weather today that on our day of our recording, but it's been nice. How Are you, are you watching much playoff hockey? Oh, pretty much every game this year so it's been nice to see the some of the interesting storylines that have come out i think compared to the past couple years i don't know what you think i think this has been the most interesting if you're not rooting for a single team which for me after the flames were out i wasn't i think this is the most interesting playoff year as a whole in terms of storylines and players and what's going on there it's been quite interesting to watch yeah and my thought of like it, Pittsburgh, like on our last episode, uh, them basically being the favorite to win it, it's come true. And right now they're up 3 2 in the series, and it looks like they're on their way to cup number five. So, would you, it, were, would you have expected Nashville to have gone this far? I honestly, the Western Conference. I was not overly impressed by any of the teams. So, like, uh, heading into it, like, that's part of the reason why heading before the season was over, I was hoping that the Flames would actually face Chicago because I thought that they were ripe for the picking and it, it ended up being true that they were. And so the fact that the worst team that qualified for the playoffs is in Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Finals is not really a shock as much as it would be in a normal year it, the the west is basically a bunch of teams that are all very similar so it's hard to differentiate between one and another i think that the interesting thing for me in the finals has been sort of the goaltending story we have two teams that are both using both goaltenders and i think that's really showing everybody in the league that having a strong backup maybe is more important than it has been in the past and i think especially for us here in calgary it's maybe going to change the way that management is looking at building that goaltending tandem next year oh for sure and i, mean, I would not have expected you know uc soros to have been as impactful as he has been in the final round so far no and same with flurry and murray on the other side of the coin so yeah it's been interesting and there's a lot of things to take from each of the teams that reach the finals. You have Pittsburgh, who has an overwhelmingly talented group of forwards and a great goaltender in Murray. And you have Nashville, who's very weak up front, but has a very great defense and goaltending. So it's interesting to see the differences in the two teams how each one of them is very weak in one area and yet extremely strong in another to me i think we're seeing with pittsburgh that you really don't need that real star defenseman to do well and i don't think that the penguins necessarily have that guy but i think the penguins and we see this every year there's always one team that does really well because the team is a sum of its parts and together they play better than they should on paper and i think we're seeing that from the pens this year i think Everybody knows their role. Everyone's playing that role. And I think the Pens are getting away with potentially more than they should be just because they're playing so well as a unit. Yeah, well, like I, I don't think anybody thinks that Jake Gensel's going to be a 50-goal scorer or anything like that. And yet he's got, I think, 13 goals already in the playoffs. Like, just ridiculous for a rookie. Every year there's always a weird playoff star. Yeah. Well, let's move on from that, and let's uh, look ahead at the Calgary Flames. Um, that's why we're here. And I guess the best place to start as we look ahead to the draft is any comments that we've had, you or I, as 
sort of since the last time we've talked till now, not necessarily about the draft, but about the team in general. I know that uh, Treliving was on Fan 960 this week for, oh, I'd say about a good hour. Um, by the time we factored in commercials and stuff, I think it's about a 40-minute audio clip on their website. And I was surprised. We didn't hear a lot of what we usually hear about the process and all that from him. He was giving some better answers than usual. And one of the names that came up from him especially was that the Flames are really interested in uh, bringing Versteeg back, a guy you know that I've liked. Matt, what do you think about Versteeg coming back, and what do you think would be a fair compensation for him? As long as the dollars are right, like you have to expect that he's going to miss probably a third of the season just because of his injury history. So like I think he'll miss like 15 games this year. So, you know, if you factor that in, I wouldn't want to spend more than two and a half million dollars on a one or two year contract for him, even though he was a very versatile piece in the organization. And, you know, it's one of those things where if the, that is going to be, that price tag is going to be exceeded, then perhaps it wouldn't be a bad idea to try and find this year's Versteeg instead. Another similar middle six forward that it just needs a new situation. Yeah, I, I think the value prop on Versteeg is even if we let him go to July 1st, He's not going to get a lot of offers. I think the injury history is going to scare away a lot of teams. So I think that even if we wait till July 1st, we'll get a pretty good discount on him in terms of a comparable player. Um, realistically, Matt, do you think this guy's a, a third liner next year? I honestly don't expect for Steak to be back, even though look, if he's back, awesome, great, fine. But I just, for some reason, I don't think it's going to work out. So whoever replaces them, then, that position within the organization, do you think it's a top six or bottom six forward? Well, I'm expecting that the Flames are going to get a top six winger somewhere, either through trade or free agency, in the next couple of weeks. And then figuring things out. Because we have the expansion draft still to come. We're not sure if we're going to be losing a guy like Troy Brower or a guy like Brett Kulak. So, like, once all those pieces are sorted out, then you can figure out, oh, well, we can do this or that or whatever. Still too many balls in the air. I think Versteeg will be back. I think he's a bottom six guy, and as such, I wouldn't want to pay him more than about a million and a half, especially because of his injury history. I mean, if you look at comparables on the team, you look at a guy like Boma, who's making 2.2. He's oft injured as well, but a lot younger. Um, you know, we, we've got some guys in there like Stajan who are making more. But, if we, you know, we really don't have a player right now next year who's going to be in that million-dollar range. I, um, all of them are RFAs or UFAs. But Yeah, well, actually, there is one candidate who... True Living did mention will be in the NHL to start next season unless he plays himself out of it. And that's Jankowski. Mark Jankowski. And I wouldn't be entirely shocked if Jankowski starts on the wing on a line, say, like with Backlund, like how Kachuk and Bennett and uh, other players have been put with Backlund to, like, ease them in. I wouldn't be shocked if something like that happened where... He was eased into the lineup in a depth role like that. But see, to me, if I'm going to bring in, and just looking at the lineup, I mean, if I'm going to bring in Jankowski, I think that there's other guys I get rid of first than say that he's taking uh, Versteeg's spot. You know, we've got a guy like <sighs> Freddie Hamilton, even a guy like Alex Chason, I'd probably bring, if I want to put Janko on the wing, I'd probably bring him in over Chason. True. You know, I mean, Hamilton's making 6-12. I don't know if he's staying here just because of his brother, but there's got to be better options out there for that one. Yeah. Um, well, it's one of those things that as the... And then we got Lazard, next, too. Yeah, it, as things sort themselves out. Like, I I honestly wouldn't be shocked if Stajan and Boma got bought out if they're not claimed in the way, uh, expansion draft. So, it there's a lot of permutations that are coming up because like the flames have to start putting in some younger kids into the lineup and actually 
trusting them because like if you look at teams like nashville and pittsburgh uh they don't have guy many players like Stajan and boma and versteeg and brower on their depth lines taking up spots they've got younger players trying to figure their game out at the nhl level i think around this time every year we start looking at trades that might happen and players that our teams might move and i think this year we're going to see maybe not just from calgary but i think league-wide we're going to see a ton more um deals done and a ton more player movement than we usually would yeah i think the next three weeks are going to probably be the busiest in uh probably a decade or more and it's interesting i didn't think about it till i heard tree living on the radio but he said you're probably not going to see a lot of deals done before the expansion draft because now you've got to make that guy that you just traded for you've got to find a way to protect him which means i'm protecting somebody else yeah like say for example um the flames wanted to get grubauer from washington the goalie back up there well they don't have a secondary guy that they can expose so they'd have to expose holtby at that point which means that we'd have to include mccollum to trade him there and then we'd have to expose Grubauer, you know, because we don't have a secondary goalie that we can expose. So, like, that's where... But even if you, say, trade a forward for a defenseman, like, Calgary wouldn't want to bring in a number four at this point because we can only protect three. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be a lot of nonsense in the days and weeks right after the expansion draft i don't think you'll see more than a couple of surface level trade like forward for forward d-man for d-man goalie for goalie type trades before the expansion draft yeah and and i think it's going to be pretty similar players if anything it's not going to be like a young guy for an older guy. yeah it's sort of like uh the the mares trade uh when he was uh for from san jose to uh dallas where it was uh, Dylan for Demers, two very similar defensemen, one swapped out for the other. Yeah, I think you'll see hockey moves done before then. Yeah. So just to remind people of the timeline for that draft, on June 17th, a week from the day that we record this, the NHL protected lists are submitted. So each team will be submitting their list to the league as far as who's protected, who's not. Then Vegas has the 18th, 19th, and 20th to make their selections from each team. And the Vegas roster will be announced at the uh, NHL awards ceremony on the 21st. And we're not sure exactly what that's going to look like yet, but those are the dates that we have. And then the 23rd is the NHL entry draft. So I would imagine between the 21st and the 23rd, things are going to be very busy. Yeah, it'll be a fun time. And talking about that, Matt, why don't we jump right into that NHL entry draft this year? Yes, that sounds like a good idea. Um, every year, you know, we have the entry draft. Teams are using that draft to bring new players in the league, and it's always interesting to see what happens there. I think that overall, if we look at the impressions of this year, it's a fairly weak draft is what most people are telling us. Yeah, it, the first couple of picks, uh, Hersher and Patrick, probably would have went 8th to 10th last year, so just to give a, more of a reasonable look at those players and but then once you get in from like third to about 15 or so uh, those are more like your middle round picks from last year and then it it drops pretty much on the same level from there on in so it's more of a typical draft the further you go it's just the front end is a complete disaster compared to say last year or the year before and i think the flames if you look at the office for the flames they would agree with that looking at the movement they've made so just to recap as of june 10th when we're recording this as far as what picks the flames have this is one of the few years that we don't have anyone else's pick this year um we i believe we only have our picks and two of those are gone so as of right now we have the First round pick, the 16th overall selection, which is our pick. Uh, we do not have our second round pick, which will be the 47th overall selection. That was traded to Ottawa for Curtis Lazar. Uh, we don't have our third round pick, the 78th overall selection. That was traded to Arizona for Michael Stone. Uh, 
which means the Flames won't be picking again until day two. And they'll pick in the fourth round at 109, the fifth round at 140, the sixth round at 171, and the seventh round at 202nd overall. So, I mean, really, we, we're we missing out on two rounds there that are very important. Second and third round picks are really important picks. But we've also seen the Flames are able to take some guys later in the draft to become impactful. So, Matt, without getting into actual players there, what do you think of the picks that the Flames actually have available? First, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Well, I think the player that the Flames should be able to get at 16, uh, he that player should be a quality player, not somebody who's going to be a game breaker. Like, I'm not expecting a first line forward, but there should be some quality there where the upsides may be a 50 point second line winger or a three, four defenseman, something like that. So there is a, a quality player there available. And like the flames are actually in a good spot because there's about 15 players that are a higher quality. And then it drops a bit from there. And with the Flames picking 16th overall, likely we will get one of them because, you know, and if not, then I, I could see the Flames dropping back a few picks because there's not really much difference from, like, 16 to 22. Yeah, uh, it's just one of those things that it, it's sort of like a year like uh, the Jankowski pick where there's not really a ton of difference between any of the picks from 16 to like 30 even so if you can acquire additional assets then hey great awesome but again that that's one of those things that you you can't predict this now a couple weeks before the draft that's a draft day thing because teams know generally know who the other teams are going to take like last year the flames knew that the uh, canucks were going to take jewel levy so, like, when uh, Columbus took Dubois, they knew that they were going to get Kachuk. So, it's one of those things that when things start sorting themselves out in picks 1 through 15, the Flames will know, oh, we're going to get this guy or that guy, or those guys are going to be off the table and let's trade down. So, just one of those things that it, it'll be interesting to see, but I, I think there will be enough quality there that the Flames will likely pick at 16. Are you worried about the fact the Flames don't pick at 2 and 3 as far not, as their output not for at this all. draft? Not at all. Uh, honestly, Curtis Lazar, he... Even though he profiles more as a third, fourth line forward, uh, the likelihood that whatever is available at 47 would turn into something better than that is very slim. And I'd rather take, in this particular draft, I'd rather take the sure thing. Because you know that Lazar is going to play for us next year and the year after and the year after that. Where whomever 47 is going to be, uh, I doubt it. So, like, I wouldn't have traded the second round pick last year for Lazar. But then again, you know, getting Parsons and Dubé are, is different than getting somebody who might be more of a third round or fourth round pick quality player instead. and i think that third round pick to arizona for stone was a steal oh yeah you're, you're for not sure. gonna find a defenseman of that quality anywhere near the third round this year oh no and the likelihood that stone will be back like i'm sure that that's priority number one for the flames is making sure he's back because he was great for the flames at the end of the season so, we'll see. I think that we have to be realistic, as you were saying, for fans going into this draft. We're not going to have a situation like we have the last two first-round picks that the Flames have taken in Bennett and Kachuk, where I think we have a profile of a player who could probably immediately make the jump to the NHL. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that really what we're looking at here is going to be a pick more like the Jankowski pick in 2012, where we're taking a guy who has a lot of potential, but does need some some more time in an amateur league, be that the Canadian league, be that, you know, wherever they're playing. Yeah, like this Europe. is not a player that's going to see NHL ice until likely 2020. 
So yeah, I think if you want to see whoever it is we take, you come to the rookie development camp on the uh, July 4th through 7th, and you'll see them there. But, you know, don't expect to see this year's 16th overall pick, or if we trade down or up slightly, don't expect to see this year's first-round pick in a, F- a Calgary Flames jersey on opening day of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, so just kind of – that doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad pick, I just think that it, you know, we have to be realistic there, and you know, I think it's going to be a pick more like a Jankowski or a Berchi or 2012-2011 picks, where they're going to need some seasoning time. Mm-hmm. And that's more common anyway. It is, and you know, you and I have had the discussion. I still debate if Sam Bennett was rushed to the NHL or not. Um, you know, we could we could discuss that all day as far as if he's if he should have maybe been seasoned a little bit more, but. Either way, I I just want to preface for fans, it doesn't necessarily mean that player's a bad player, but looking at where they would fit in the lineup, I don't think you're doing that player a a lot of favors bringing them in as a third-line player next year. Yeah, and especially a a guy who the Flames may select, Elias Peterson. Like, he's six foot two, but he weighs 160 pounds. Like, there's no way that guy's getting into the NHL next year. So, you know, (laughs) like, there are players like that where... They just need time to fill their body out and round things off so that way they're not going to get abused. So, you know, like that, it depends a lot on who and what, but I don't see any of the players making the jump right away. No. Even next year, like in 2018, 2019, I don't see any of these players playing either. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I think like Jankowski, I mean, we drafted Jankowski in 2012, and it's now you know going to be 2017 by the time he makes the roster. I think you're looking at a similar timeline for whoever our first pick is this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, if you were the GM drafting in this draft, what strategy do you think you'd use, especially in that first round? Would you go for best player available, or would you be focusing on organizational need at this point? For me... Uh- I am always the advocate of doesn't matter which pick you have, talent, 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 talent. And I don't care if it's a goalie, a defenseman, a center, a right winger, a left winger, as long as they are good, you can always make a trade. And look at Nashville with Seth Jones. Like they already had an abundance of defensemen. They still took him because he was the best pick available then. And then they went out and dealt him for Ryan Johansson. So if it ends up that the best player available to us at 16 is a center, well, yeah, we have Jankowski, we have Bennett, we have Backlund, we have Monaghan. So you can always deal one of them later if need be, if that guy hits his potential as well for some other area that you need more of whatever it is and well in that case too you could always trade down one or two spots too and get an asset for doing that if you say hey you know the next best guy available is the centerman we don't really need the centerman a defenseman's coming up there may be some value to trading down there and again it depends on the who's and the what's (laughs) so we'll see it there's a lot of factors that have to go in it but i don't really care whether it's the fourth fifth sixth or seventh round just shoot for talent because on the odd chance that one of those guys turns out you're gonna get likely be getting a top six forward because of the fact that they fell because they were incomplete so you know if you're getting a skill forward out of that or a defenseman hey awesome and if they bust okay sure why not who cares so, yeah, I, I don't know if I totally agree with that. I think the talent thing um, is especially important in the first three rounds. I think with rounds four through seven, you can start to target guys who maybe fit a certain profile. Maybe you want to get one bigger player, or maybe you're looking for a right-handed shot or something like that. I think the first three rounds, definitely it's best player available, most talented player available, or most complete, depending on how you look at that. But generally a player in the last four in the last three or four rounds is going to have some flaws and i think that you know you have to at that point start to fill in certain roles and if you look at what the flames have done in the last few years they've done a good job of that Mm -hmm. with that do you see i mean we've talked about the flames trading up or down 
Do you see any, and I, I know that you'll probably say, you know, it could happen, it depends. Do you see any scenario in your mind where the Flames move out of the first round this year? Yeah, I do. What's if, the scenario? If the Flames can target a high-quality top six right winger and just sacrifice the first round pick, I can see it. Like if who, do, the, who would if, you be targeting for that? Uh, for me, it would be uh, sending the pick to Detroit for Gustav Nyquist. Um, okay. He's 27, so he, he fits the same age profile as Backlund. And he, he had 28 goals a couple of years ago. Last year was a bit of a down year, but give me a break. It's Detroit. They were having their worst season in a generation. So I don't think not... you're going to get Nyquist straight for the first. No, but you could... Uh, possibly get him for that and like a smaller depth prospect or something yeah boma or poirier or something like that yeah yeah he had uh 48 points last year 43 the year before 54 and 48 so you know he's a fairly good quality second line forward i could see that being a good fit and he's a, a sniper, which is something that the Flames actually lack, so that would also help. Do you see any scenario in which the Flames get back into rounds two or three? Only if they trade down. Uh, I don't see the point in sacrificing assets to get into the second or third round. Like, I wouldn't trade Poirier for a third round pick this year. No, I, I've heard a lot of people say that they hope the Flames can make another hamilton light deal, but without a second and third, we don't have the assets to pull something like that off again. Um, yeah, unless you're with... yeah, unless you're sacrificing like Anderson or Shillington or something like that, and at that point, is that a good use of your assets? Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think that we're going to be out of rounds two and three unless maybe we trade down, like I was saying, maybe the Flames say, hey, we'll move from 16th to 19th. And in doing so, we'll pick up a third. I think you'd have to move significantly down to get a second. Uh, not really. Uh, um, past years, you can get a second for just moving down a spot or two. So. Oh, really? It just depends on how desperate that the other team wants that pick. So, yeah, it just depends really on what the ask is. So. Yeah, I, I can't see us picking up both rounds. No. I think we'll get one or the other. Um, and like you said, I don't know this is the year to trade assets to get back into the draft. No. The, we traded those picks away for a reason, and it's not worth trying to trade back into rounds two or three. Yeah, plus the Flames currently organizationally have a bit of a log jam in Stockton and in now Kansas City where they have too many players just in the organization that are needing spots so having a few less picks this year isn't all is also not necessarily a bad thing yeah. just because we have to clear out some of the bodies in order to get like the next wave of people in looking at the players we have though matt i think that these guys wouldn't be ready for a couple of years to turn pro anyways the guys at that no. level and True. i think that log jam is gonna sort of fix itself every year we're gonna have a couple guys come off the books so I don't see anyone in rounds, say, three through seven this year who is going to turn pro next year. Oh, no. Or has to turn pro next year. They might in the right well, organization. Well, gonna... it, it depends. Like, if you got a Shillington-type situation where you can put a Euro guy into the A right away, and it makes sense. But even I then, looking, looking at the guys in this, from what I see in this year, I would rather True. they play in Europe. True. Could you do it? Yeah. But I think the fact that we're... The AHL team is so packed. I think you'd almost be better to say, you know what, a guy, every guy this year has some flaws. Yeah. And I think the further down we go, the more flaws I'm seeing in the game. And I think they're better to play against men in Europe than come play in the AHL next year. I agree. And a lot of the younger guys we're seeing are 16, 17 year olds who I'd be going after in those, in those later rounds um, you know, 17, 18, not necessarily guys that would even be AHL eligible yet. So not 16, 17 or 18 year olds who I'd be going after. But yeah. um, so with that, then I think we're we're pretty much 
agreed that we would want to stick with the picks we have. Let's talk about these picks. We're not going to do the same draft profile that we have in the past. Um, in terms of, you know, going through every round, round by round, I think really there's only one pick that needs a lot of emphasis, and that's the first pick, the 16th overall. And then we'll talk generally about what the Flames might do in four through seven. Yeah, and uh, the number one organizational need is a right shooting forward. And unfortunately, this draft is very scarce with the, that specific type of player. Uh, only four players it, are right shots in that range from anywhere from like 10 through, say, 25. Um, the first one is Martin Nikas, who's you know, on some lists is in the top 10. Uh, honestly, I don't see that particular player getting past Detroit. He's a very similar player to a guy like Martin Havlatter, Yuri Hoodler, just your solid middle six I've been watching some footage of him, and that's the first thing I thought is this guy looks like a Red Wing. Yeah, and they pick at number nine, so you can pretty much start to pencil that name on that <laughs> in on the ninth overall pick. Uh, the next guy is Nicholas Suzuki, a, a player that will remind a lot of Flames fans as Sven Berchi. He's a center, but he's only 5'11", and he'll probably be a right winger at the nhl level if and when he makes it very similar makeup and body type as berchi so if you know you're a big fan of berchi then you'll be wanting the flames to pick suzuki if not then you'll be wanting the flames to avoid him like the plague uh, so Matt, you have a list of guys here who you think um, you would like to see the Flames target at 16. Yeah, I know. I just want to get through the the sure. four right shots first and then go on that. Uh, the next guy is Kalen Foot, uh, Adam Foot's son. He's a defenseman and a right shot from the blue line. And the fourth guy is Robert Thomas, who's a bit of an underrated player. I would actually expect him to... He's rated in the 20s, but I could see him go as high as, like, 12, depending on, on if somebody's enamored with him. He's a playmaker-style forward. Not, yeah, if, not, you, if you look at the North American skater ratings on NHL.com, Thomas is 22nd. Yeah, so it'd be a reach for the Flames to pick him there. It, and he's more of a finesse playmaker style guy so not really something that the flames are desperately needing in the organization either so uh there's also owen Tippett, who in some lists is falling a bit but i and he is a sniper type but i'm not a fan of his makeup of his game so i think he's gonna be more of a bust type guy that who someone who's very good for the uh junior level but will hit that wall as the competition gets better. Yeah, I don't know. I could see a guy like him going to an organization that needs some some depth players. Um, you know, I know he's going to go a lot lower than Vegas picks, but a team like that who's just looking for depth. Yeah, I could see that. You know, like I, I think he's got some NHL potential. I don't think he's going to be a top six in any team, but you got to remember that teams need to fill out their bottom six pretty cheap these days too. Yeah. Now on to the fun part. Um, the my favorites for the pick at sixteen. I, I like guys with upside the most, and the the number one guy on my list is uh, uh, actually the player that I referenced earlier, Elias Peterson. Uh, he, rem if you watch video of him, you see a lot of Johnny Gaudreau. Uh, he's a very thin tall player he's six foot two and like 160 pounds soaking wet uh yeah 100 six foot two 165 is what he's officially listed at he's an 18 year old centerman and left winger from sweden yeah and very dynamic good hands uh very quick with his hands and just uh he very m much reminds me of gaudreau just like uh clayton keller last year uh, P 
Peterson's a bigger physical player, though, like just height wise. So I think that he might go in the top 10 just for that reason, because you can see a lot of similarity between those three players' games. So if he's on the board at 16, I think that's. I would be shocked if the Flames went in a different direction. Yeah, I don't. I don't know about this guy. I mean, I I like Peterson because he's pretty much a jack of all trades. He can play in all three zones really well. For a, he's a bigger guy than a Goudreau, and I think you know when we compare him to Goudreau, we have to be careful of that because he's not a small guy, but he's quick, and I think he's only going to get quicker from here. And he does have some of that, uh, you know, that hard nose play that the Flames like a little bit of that Brian Burke like truculence. So yeah, I think if he's available. Um, He'd be a good pick. I think you're right, though. Somebody before us in the top 15 picks might take a flyer on this guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Honestly, I'm not expecting him to get past Los Angeles, uh, and I think that may end up be where he gets selected. Uh, the n- next guy on my list is... Uh, before you go on, uh, Elias Peterson as listed by Button. I always kind of look at Button, uh, Craig Button at TSN as pretty much being pretty close to what ended up happening he listed eight there so yeah i mean button thinks he'll probably end up going in the in the top 10 yeah that would be my like hope he falls to 16 it's doubtful but hoping that that happens uh the next guy is a a player with a very similar sounding name elias anderson instead of peterson and uh Again, a center left winger and a little smaller, but very much more stocky at 195 pounds at 5'11". Five five foot foot 11. 11, 195. So this is more of a Goudreau height player, but a bigger player. Yeah, and the player he reminds me of almost a carbon copy of Alex Wenberg, the center for the Columbus Blue Jackets. Uh, very similar statistical profile between the two players. Very similar games, very good two-way players, very smart player, a uh, guy in the same generic mold of Frolik and Backland. Uh, is, if his offense doesn't translate to the NHL, I would expect him to be a 35 to 50 point player uh, with Wenberg, who I think had 59 points last year, being more of his upside but uh, just a very smart, dependable two-way guy. Both Peterson and Anderson are playing in the Swedish uh, league, the SHL, what used to be the Swedish Elite League. And I think that could be a benefit for us this year. Again, not having to bring that guy over, but still having him play at a very high level, I think it's going to be good for for that first-round pick this year. Yeah. The next two guys are a pair of defensemen. Uh very different defensemen. Uh, the first one is, I mentioned earlier, Kalen Foot, Adam Foot's son. He's not a physical guy like his father. Uh, he's a six foot three, one hundred ninety eight pound defenseman. Probably will be about two fifteen, two twenty when he fills out. A uh, some comparables to him are Brent Seabrook, which. I can see. Uh, Just a generic, generally good at everything, not uh, awesome at any one thing type of guy. Decent shot from the point, right-handed shot. Salt, like if that's who the Flames walked away with, I would have zero complaints. The Flames defense prospects is already a strength, adding another guy who's probably better than any of the ones that we already have is would do nothing but help so you know and he has the size so that would help as well because all of the flames defensive prospects are average sized so yeah i you know and kellen foot is uh six foot three 209 he plays for Kelowna of the whl so a guy who's close by for the Flames, they probably had a lot of looks at him. Kelowna's in the Dome a lot. Um, he had some pretty good stats last year in the WHL for a defenseman. He had In 71 games, he had six goals, 51 assists for 57 total points. This is a guy who I think is a good two-way defenseman. I I don't I think if you're looking at him to be that you know that number one, I think more than Seabrook. Seabrook has a better offensive upside than this guy. 
Yeah, it, uh, if I would almost say like a TJ Brody level offense, like Brody's not going to light the world on fire at all in his career in terms of offense. Like he's not going to put up 60 points and like, I don't, I wouldn't expect a foot hits his potential to be more than a 35 point defenseman, but you know, he's just a solid all the way around can make a good outlet pass good at both ends of the ice just a decent overall player not gonna blow you away but not bad i think you'd be lucky to have foot turn into a number three in your organization i think i'd project him as sort as a number four long term yeah a good number four yeah and, and you know for a guy who is where he is i think he's probably gonna get a few extra looks just because of who his dad is um you know i think that might help him out yeah, but I wouldn't I, be shocked if he went in the top ten either, just for that fact as well. Yeah, I'm. I would like to see actually the Flames take a defenseman. It's been a while since we've taken a defenseman first overall, or first round, I should say. Um, and I think that we have enough forwards. I don't know that I, we need a draft a forward to fill that role. I think we've got enough centermen and wingers coming through the system. But I like the idea of bringing foot in. And if he makes it to 16th, I would probably actually take him over Peterson. Uh, I'd probably take Peterson. It, it it would be a tough coin toss, though. It, it, yeah, that, that's it's tough because the, they're both very good. So it yeah, just looking at the depth chart for this organization, I think that we have enough young forwards coming in um and guys you know who are surprising us if i look at the defensive side of guys not who not turned pro yet adam fox is really the only guy there who you know i think really has some potential yeah well we'll see uh it, yeah i think i would still take peterson but like it it would be a coin toss pretty much like 60 40 peterson to foot but yeah it, it'd be tough i could hey you know if the flames took foot with peterson on the board i'd be like okay sure i can understand that so i wouldn't be overly disappointed either way let's say that let's just put this scenario in place let's say peterson and foot are both on the board at 16 would you be willing to trade down knowing you're not going to get peterson get foot and pick up let's say a third round pick it would depend on how far and if you knew what pick 17, 18, 19, and 20 are type of thing. Like, depending, like, wherever the you end up. Like, I wouldn't want to... Like, if those were the two guys on the board and, like, everybody else is kind of below them, like, I wouldn't want to sacrifice getting one of them. No, but let's say you knew them. that you could trade down and still get foot. Yeah. Then for sure... But, uh, yeah, that'd be tough. Mm. So, um, Just reading here for fans that don't know Foot, um, his write-up on EliteProspects.com says that Foot is an assertive two-way defenseman that reads plays quickly and understands both the offensive and defensive sides of the role that he's put into. He plays a consistent game and can be trusted to create chances from the back and on special teams. He uses size to gain leverage against other players, though he isn't overly physical. His hockey sense is outstanding, and his ability not just to read, but to start and on the odd occasion finish plays is overtly in indicative of, of his talent at a higher level, and that's by Curtis Joe. And, you know, it's, it's funny because you always read that about guys who are kids of NHL players. They have a really good hockey sense, and I think that's probably just because they've grown up with the game more than other players have. Yeah. And... The next, moving on to the next guy on the list is a player that is very similar to one of the Flames prospects, Timothy Lilligren. And he's basically all over Shillington all over again. And he was expected to be a top five pick like Shillington was and fell because his defensive game is kind of mediocre, even though he's a very good offensive defenseman and very smart in the offensive zone and a good skater, good speed, good agility, just as a mess defensively. So that's another player that's available. It's, it's literally Shillington all over again. So if the Flames like what they have in Shillington, they might 
opt to go and and if he's on the board at 16 go and get another one i'm not too familiar with this guy um he's also playing in the swedish elite league right now but from everything i've seen he's expected to go about 10 or 11 yeah it Similar to Shillington, who was expected to be in the first round when we picked him, he ended up falling, and Lilligren may end up doing the same thing. So the, I, I've seen him anywhere from 3 to 12 in my research, so it, the Flames being at 16, it's possible. So. Yeah, if you take a look, he's rated number 10 by Hockey Prospects. Dot com number eight by ISS number twenty two by Future Considerations number twenty by McKean's Hockey and number six by the NHL Central Scouting among EU players. So, yeah, there's a guy who's all over the board. I think that there's better options out there for the Flames. This is the kind of guy that I think you might wait and see if he drops to round two. But I I don't think I would pick him not having a second round pick. I think there's still other guys on the board. Yeah, who I would take over him. And the wild card is the Russian guy. He's a center and a right winger, uh, Clem Costin. Uh, he's six foot three, one ninety, and a, a fairly good dynamic offensive player. It's just the whole Russian factor that it, he he may end up going very early, even in the top ten if a team likes him, or he could fall out of the first round. So. And skill wise, he's probably one of the top six or seven players in the draft. Well, the Angels ranked him number one among European skaters. Yeah, and honestly, I think he if it wasn't like if he was Canadian, I think he might be rated second or third overall this year. It's just the whole Russian factor. Yeah, you, know, you know, it it happens every year. There's always a good Russian player and you know where is he gonna go basically it, the quality is there it's just does that that team whomever is going to pick him want to deal with the potential headache well and that's why i think the flames what, not having a second or third round pick might be more likely to take a a run at this guy because they can't you know if he falls to round two it does us no good there's no chance he falls to round four no so I think you might see the Flames say, you know what, maybe they take maybe they take a little bit of a flyer on this guy, even with the Russian factor, knowing that, you know what, if we want him, we have to take him in round one. Yeah. Um, not so much for the Russian players, but some remember with other players like Swedish guys and, um, you know, Finnish is the Olympic factor, right? This year, NHL players aren't going to participate. Russia's still got a good number of players over in the KHL, but some of these Swedish guys might be good enough to make the Olympic roster this year. Yeah. And that's, you know, that and not saying that that really helps the development a, a ton, but that's a, you know, a great sign too if you've got players that are playing at that higher level. So something to think about when we're looking at these players as well. Yeah. And like there are other players that will likely be available, like guys like Michael Rasmussen and Eli Tolvin and it's just that they're like in Rasmussen's case he he's one of those players that's rated highly because he's big not because he's skilled so eh, I wouldn't bother and Tolvanen has a good shot but nothing else and like the defensemen are just kind of there like there's nobody else that stands out as oh that guy you know we need to select that player so like honestly i it i don't see the flames trading down this year because if once you get past 16 if one of the players that we didn't mention or like we mentioned isn't on the board then sure but like there's not really going to be any difference between a guy like yamamoto or polling or any of the other guys that might be available so at that point just t you know get the dartboard out and toss cause... yeah so so i mean if we look at some of the pundits out there a uh, friend of the show ryan pike who writes for the hockey writers and flames nation he thinks that clem costin will be the flames pick at 16 um, again going back to button and what he was thinking he thinks that 16 the flames might take kyler yamamoto 
another right winger, um, or I guess center center left wing. Sorry, I think Yamamoto is. I like his game, but I don't want to draft a five foot eight player. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like it, Yamamoto probably has the highest skill level of anybody in the twelve to thirty range. It's just that uh, do the Flames want to get another Gaudreau in terms of size and. I'm, I'm not sure that Yamamoto is as talented as Gaudreau. I think a, a comparable would be Anthony Beauvillier. Uh, just a good player. Probably will be a top six forward in the NHL, but the Flames I already mean, are kind of small. Gaudreau is so good that we can overlook his size. From what I've seen about Yamamoto, I don't think that's going to happen. I think this is just going to be another guy who becomes your quote-unquote small guy. And yeah. I think that, you know, we're already seeing enough problems with Goudreau getting slashed and that sort of thing that I don't know I want to start putting another small guy through. No, like we already have Manjapani and Matthew Phillips. Like if those guys turn out, hey, awesome. But like then that creates another problem of, okay, we've got now two or three very small players in the organization and – I would like rather in, take this. I would rather take the flyer on the small player in rounds four through seven. Same here. Um, so I don't think Yamamoto is going to go. I'd be happy with any of those guys. Um, I wouldn't be unhappy if Clem Coston was our pick. I think. No, I, me either. I think I'd be worth, especially in a draft year like this year. I think it's worth taking a flyer on the Russian. Yeah, uh, and I. Uh, more than anything this year, I think the Flames can go for the home run. Like at last year, the Flames needed to get quality because even then the system needed quality more than anything. And they got it between the, the first four picks uh, with Parsons, Dubé, Fox, and Kachuk. So this year, why not go for the home run? Get a guy who might have that first line potential. Uh, that's part of the reason why i like peterson why i like uh anderson foot to a lesser extent i think he'll be a good number four and costin would be my four guys that i would most like the flames to pick after that any- it's you know after that it's eh, is this guy a little better than that guy eh, you know like you're starting to split hairs at that point yeah, I think I don't think Anderson or Peterson are going to be on the board when we pick. No, neither um, do I. I actually, I'm kind of thinking all four might be gone by the time we pick. I think Costin's going to scare a lot of people because he is Russian. I think he's. I don't think he'll go in the top ten. I think he'll probably go between ten and seventeen. Yeah. I. I would not be opposed to taking foot. I don't think we need a guy who's going to be a number one oh, defenseman. No. I know, no. Like if the that's who the Flames walk away with, awesome. I don't. I you on our recap show. I'll be going. Hey, the great pick, awesome. Yeah, fits what and we think, need. And I think too, after what we did last year, we took a guy who you know in Kachuk, who is a second generation player, and we've heard from him in interviews and stuff how much his dad has helped him, you know, transition in and you know been there to be that rock. So that might make the Flames more likely to say, you know what, let's do it again. Let's take another second generation guy who has dad in his corner. To yeah, really look help at uh, Josh Manson in Anaheim. How he's developed into a high quality player for the Ducks, and yet he had no pedigree either, other than his father played in the NHL for a number of years. Yeah, I mean his his father's at a very different level than a you know a Keith Kachuk or a Adam Foot. Yeah, but he's still the same thing. Grew up yeah. around the game and. To me, I've always said that pretty much anything can be taught except for hockey sense. I yeah. think hockey sense is one of those things you have it or you don't. Yeah, I haven't and, that, seen an- yeah and that's exactly why, like, with all of the Flames pick, like, hammer hockey sense first above everything else because if they figure it out, then you've got a good high-quality player on your hands instead of just a filler guy. Yeah, no, for sure. And and I guess I bring it up because I think that we can see already at the WHL level that Foot has that hockey sense. And, you know, I would be willing to say, you know what, he's got some rough edges we need to smooth out. 
Um, but but give me a break. Anybody who's not in the top two at the age of 18 is going to have rough edges. Yeah. But I think more so than usual. Like if this was last year's draft, I think Kalen foot would fall to round two. Probably. Or like the last couple of picks, like 25 to 30. And if you look at our blue line, I think, you know, Giordano's aging, but let's say that we've got uh, Brody and Hamilton as the two upcoming guys. We've got Shillington Anderson following up there. I think we have enough time to develop foot correctly that by the time we're ready for him, there's going to be a spot in the lineup for him. So I don't think we need to rush him. I don't think we need to, you know, have him ready next year. I think this is a good developmental pick. Yeah, I agree. And... It, it's just it'll be interesting to see what's on the board and available at 16 uh, draft day this year will be probably more interesting than usual just for uh, the equivalency between all of the players basically in terms of talent from about five right through till about 20 so like there's not a huge drop off at any point it's just a sliding scale and because scale, of that so i think you're going to see less teams moving up or down as well yeah i think if you can't move into the top 5 it's really not worth moving up or down very much yeah like it just depends on what you're shopping for basically like there's plenty of larger players that have upside there's plenty of high skill smaller players it just whatever you want we got it basically so it just it'll depend on what the priorities of teams from vegas right through to us are and what they want most of all and see how it goes for sure not having to pick in rounds two or three, the Flames are going to have to rely on late rounds in order to fill out the rest of their stock for this year, which gives them a pick in round four, round five, round six, and round seven as we sit here and record on June 10th. I feel more confident this year than I probably would have in the past that the Flames can get something of value in those last rounds. I think you'll definitely see them take a goaltender. You've mentioned it before. Uh, that I'm can... actually going to disagree. This year, I don't think they will. No. Uh, normally, I'm a fan of, as I've harped on for many years, that like take a goalie every year. But I think that with the quality that Parsons and Gillies have sh- and Riddich have shown, I think that uh, the Flames may take a year off of picking okay. a goaltender. Just because we have three really high-quality players for a change. and But again, three guys who are you know either pro or have turned pro. Yeah, I know. Uh, I could see them taking it, but I would not expect it. That's... Okay. And, you know, looking at those last four picks, the Flames since 2008 have done a lot better than I think um, a lot of other teams maybe have. You know, people always cite the the fluke in round seven who makes it to the NHL, um, you know, that sort of thing. But we've actually done pretty well. In 2008, we took a guy in the fourth round who you might know. His name's TJ Brody. Even um, in the third round, got Lance Boma that year. Yeah. The next year in 2009, the Flames took Yoni Ordio as a goaltender who projected to be pretty good. Um, uh, you know, m- made it to the NHL, I think, kind of got the short end of a stick, but a good pick there. Um, 2010, I remember we were very excited about John Ramage as a pick, and he never really turned into much of anything. Yeah. But in round five, Michael Furland, a guy who... We could debate if you should or shouldn't have, but played a lot of first line minutes this year. Yeah, and is looking like a top six forward. So we'll see. Twenty eleven, the Flames got Goudreau in this fourth round, um, and and Laurent Brassois, who was subsequently traded to Edmonton. That's true. Yep. Uh, Twenty twelve, the Flames got Kulak, and in the fourth round, Culkin in the fifth round. So again, two guys there that you know have become part of this team. Two guys who've been around for a while. Brett Kulak has 30 NHL games now under his belt. So, you know, not necessarily guys that we're going to project to be top-line players, and I think even Furland isn't a first-line center on an ideal team, but guys that are contributing to the team. Yeah, and even Gillies in the third round that year was a good pick. For sure. 
2013 um, was a bad year outside of the Monaghan pick, <laughs> so we'll just I don't skip know. that. I, I think Poirier and Klimchuk are going to give the organization value. I don't necessarily think they will necessarily be in a Flames jersey. True. But I think there's value to be had from both those players. Yeah. 2014. You and I have debated, yeah. Take, but yeah. Yeah. 2014. Um, 2014 is Bennett and a whole lot of nothing at this point. Hickey might turn into something, but Hickey and Matson, I think there's some potential with. Yeah, everybody else, it's starting to get to the point of put up or shut up. But I mean, and, just looking at those bottom, you know, anything after three that year, we picked uh, first, second, third, sixth, and seventh, and our sixth and seven were Matson and Carroll. So yeah. Matson maybe, Carroll yeah. probably not. Uh, yeah. 2015 in round five we picked Pavel Karnikov. In six in round six we took Andre Mangiapane, and in round seven Riley Bruce. I think Mangiapane's got something. Yeah, I think he's going to be a, a quality NHL player. And Karnikov we... might if he ever decides to come back. There's still Riley... something there, but yeah, I I don't know. There's something there, but I don't know it's NHL level. I think Karnikov might be uh, not the type of player, but just type of career, very similar to a, a Jamie Lundmark type who gets a cup of coffee with a bunch of teams hoping to make something of him, or even like a Pavel Brendel in that way. But ultimately, yeah. I don't think he's going to amount to much at the NHL level. Yeah, I think he's better to stay in, in Europe because I think he'll play at a higher level there than he ever would over here. Um, and then last year, the Flames did quite well in the draft. Uh, round four, we took Linus Lidstrom. Round five, we took Mitchell Matson, And in round six, we took Itu Tutuola as well as Matthew Phillips. And round seven, we took Stepan Falkowski. So some guys, I mean, we're only a year out, but I don't think any of those guys necessarily become top six players. But I think that there's some, some potential there, especially a guy like Phillips. Yeah. And... It's interesting to note that in each of the case, like uh, the last two drafts have been the first two that I consider to be under Brad Treliving because the 2014 draft, Treliving just had got hired and it was a Brian Burke show. Uh, you can tell by the type of players that we took, it was a Brian Burke draft. Uh, yeah, well, Treliving hadn't been around long enough to influence things. Yeah, and yeah, whatever. But anyhow, um, Looking at the depth picks, you have guys that have size with Riley Bruce, Itu Tuola, Matson, and Falkowski. So just larger physical players. Um, Falkowski and Tuola have better offensive upside while being physical and big. And the other guys are. Well, Bruce is already out of the organization, and Matson is a project that will he's going to the NCAA, and we'll see in a couple of years whether there's anything there there. And then you've got high skill players that we just have to see if they can translate in Lindstrom, Phillips, at Mangiapane, and Karnikov. And I think that. Uh, that that game plan will dictate what the Flames have going into this draft in rounds four through seven. You're likely going to see, just based off of past results, two high skill players and two larger guys. And we'll see a couple of those players, Mangiapane and Falkowski, were both overager guys. Uh in their draft plus one year, I do believe. So it, the Flames could end up selecting a couple overage players as well. It just depends largely on what's available. I don't see the Flames going for any guys like Austin Carroll or no. uh, uh, Kanzig types or well, and, Riley and you Bruce bring up types. A good point. I mean, if you look at the last two, they've picked a lot of the same type of players. You need to diversify at some point too. So, you know, I, I can't see him going with a lot of the smaller guys again. I think we have enough of the bigger prospects in the pipeline. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we maybe see them try to get somebody who's maybe not necessarily the most skilled guy, but I think we need some speed 
maybe the guys who aren't necessarily the, the best players but are very quick. Um, and I think that we – I would not be surprised if the Flames lean a little heavier on the blue line. I could see that. They've taken a lot of forwards the last couple of years, um, and I think that they might lean a little heavier on the blue line. The other thing I note about True Living's drafts with Calgary, he's very similar to Sutter, and he likes the Canadian boys. You know, I mean, if you look, most of his players are OHL or WHL guys, and so I think we'll probably see those those four those last four rounds being used on a lot of domestic players. They're easier to see, they're easier to scout, and I yeah. think that. And I could see them going... They're easier to convert, too. Yeah. Uh, alternatively, I could see them going with some guys that you can park in the NCAA for a little while as well, just to yeah. see, like, you know, give yourself an extra couple of years to see what you got. Yeah, I, I think this draft year, you're... I don't know, maybe. That was very much a uh, Jay Feaster thing, was all the NCAA guys. Um, maybe. I mean, this year I think that by the time you get down to those levels, the players aren't going to be that different. It's just a matter of who do you want, and you're going to draft more by type than by name. True. And, like, that's why, like, it's so hard to project on what any of those type of picks are going to be just because of the fact that you don't know what picks 1 through 90 are going to be. So. Yeah. It, it's hard to project on and, oh that's and, what you know let's target this specific guy you know it's yeah, is that guy gonna even be there <laughs> so uh, just generically a uh, uh, skill and size tend to be the modus operandi for the flames in the depth rounds last two I, years i can see the flames also targeting more guys who are right shots in the lower round so can i you know maybe not necessarily the biggest guy or the the most skilled guy, but I can see him saying, you know what, this guy's good enough and he's a right shot. Let's bring him in. Yeah. And if they're debating between say two guys, I could see them giving the benefit to the right shot. Yeah, I could too. So why not? We don't have many in the organization. Well, so I think it's, it's a good time to start filling that out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't prioritize that in rounds one, two or three, but in the bottom four rounds, I think you've got a little more Liberty to say, you know what? These two guys are pretty close. Let's take the right shot. Yeah. If I was running the draft, for me, what I would be doing is is kind of treating this entire draft as a bit of a, if you get anything out of it, awesome. So let's go for home run picks with one through seven. Like just highest upside possible if they've burned out and eh, it's a crap draft year. You know, so like you're giving yourself a little bit of a mea culpa there and just try to get as high of talent as possible, more so than in past years even. Just go for it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, and I was thinking that earlier. I was thinking, you know what, this is really an experimental year. Maybe try something different. Maybe get a player you normally wouldn't. And, you know, I don't think there's many guys, especially in those lower rounds, that are going to be expected to develop anyways especially looking at the last couple of years and the you know lower round picks that we have. So why not experiment? Why not try somebody different? Yeah. Throw the dart yeah. at the board if it hits. Hey, awesome. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that could be good for us. You know, that could be, could be good to, uh, you know, to try some different, see if it works out. I'm also not totally convinced the Flames will draft in all rounds four, five, six, and seven. I still think something's brewing. And I think at least one of those picks is not going to be ours come the NHL entry draft. I can agree with that. I honestly, I'm not wouldn't be shocked if the Flames ended up with the draft only having three or four picks instead of five. So draft it, one, go home and draft seven. Yeah. <laughs> or just draft round one and shut down your table. We'll see. Uh, I'm expecting a lot of like expansion draft movement like i'm sure that the flames may end up like even if they're wanting to vegas to pick a specific player they could offer like say the fourth round pick for you know we want you to take staging or bone well, that's Brower why, uh, or yeah, whatever and and that's why i'm thinking we may not have all four of them i could see the fourth or the fifth round pick being given to vegas to not take somebody or to specifically given, take 
this player. <laughs> so. Yeah, or being given to Vegas after the word, saying, hey, you took the guy we wanted, now we're going to give you Boma and a fifth. Because I think the biggest asset Vegas can get this year is draft picks. So I mm-hmm. think you're going to see a lot of moves made with them, simply acquiring picks, no matter where in the draft they are. Yeah, and Vegas specifically, I could see them walking away from this draft with like 15 or 16 or 17 picks just because of teams we don't want you to take this player here take this draft pick well i think <laughs> so, what's more likely is you'll get a guy like tra living to say you know what it's going to be easier for you to get a guy like flurry than it is for me to get a guy like flurry so you draft flurry with the condition that then we're going to turn around the next day and give you boma and our fourth for flurry yeah you know, I, I don't think there's going to be as many deals to not take a certain guy. I think there's going to be a lot more, hey, the cost of you acquiring this guy and then us acquiring him from Vegas is cheaper than us acquiring the player directly. Yep, I That's agree. That's just my prediction. So It's going to be so a fun I, couple weeks. Yeah, it's going to be a fun couple weeks. I think it'll be an interesting draft, and I always like to see what happens in those late rounds. And as always, Matt and I are going to be at the Flames Rookie Development Camp, which is at Winsport on july 4th 5th 6th and 7th so as we get close to that date make sure if you want to come um you check calgaryflames.com for all the details generally the last day so july 7th there's a scrimmage so it gives you a chance to see these players and we always like to go out and see the new draftees see the new recruits and also talk to them so if you listen to some of our early july shows generally the one right after that uh we'll have some interviews with as many of these guys as we can talk to so it'll let you get to know some of the new flames and I'm sure we'll talk before that. We usually do a July 1st show. Um, but, Matt, before we we wrap up, anything else you want to talk about as far as the entry draft? No, I'm good. Just lo- waiting patiently for it to happen, see what happens and all that fun stuff. couple housekeeping notes, I guess, before we leave. The biggest one is the Flames have changed their ECHL affiliate. Last year it was the Adirondack Thunder. And they've changed to the Kansas City Mavericks now. So that'll be their new ECHL affiliate. And really, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, this doesn't matter. Um, I don't know where the two teams ended last year in ECHL standings, but it's a place to park two or three prospects and probably Mason McDonald again. Um, So not a huge deal. But I wonder if, as part of the deal, the Flames have made the Mavericks take on the Scorch mascot. We'll see. Don't expect them to have a Flames name or anything. The Flames does not own this team. They're simply affiliated with. And the biggest difference for fans that don't know between the AHL and the ECHL, most AHL teams are owned, if not fully, as a majority ownership by the NHL team. So they're really there just to act as a developmental league. In the ECHL, I think all the teams, if not a good majority of them, are independently owned. So those owners want to make money. So they're really trying to have competitive teams. So it's not as likely you're going to put a player into the ECHL just to be developed who isn't, you know, going to help that team win because the ECHL teams want to be there for the win. So it's we'll see who goes down there. I was surprised how many players were in the ECHL this past year from the Flames. And the last thing, and one thing you and I have talked about for a while, is we know that the NHL is going to be changing jersey affiliates next year. Adidas will be taking over as the new jersey supplier. The 20th of June, the new jerseys will be unveiled, according to the NHL. So, Matt, any predictions for what we might see from the Flames or anything you do want to see from the new Flames jerseys? Uh, All I want is for the flags to go away and it to be red. (laughs) <laughs> and that's about that's it that's too much to ask my friend you can't have both no flags and red yeah like it, I'm not ex- after the piecemeal third jersey thing where it was like five different designs with like one part from each uh, with that script logo third jersey uh, I'm not overly optimistic that whatever it will be will be good so I don't know. If you remember the way that the uh, RBK stuff worked is there's pretty much a template, and you just picked a template and, you know, changed your colors on it. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same this year. Yeah. I'm just hoping that it's not too bad. Anything, you know, that's better than what the Flames currently use for their home and away would be awesome. 
But so we've uh, we've had a lot of our fans chime in on this on Twitter and Facebook, and a lot of people are saying they want to go retro, and I can't see the Flames go with an exact copy of the '80s retro jersey they've used for the third jersey if for no other reason it's not going to sell most of us who wanted to bought it but what would you feel if the flames went with a retro feel and took the black out i'd prefer they keep the black and use the retro as a third jersey like i know they're not going to have a third jersey next year but i'd rather them keep the black in somehow it's just yeah, I can see uh, both arguments. Uh, that's why I'm kind of just hoping that it's not a disaster when we see, actually see it. And What if we I, were to go with something like the current Flames third jersey, take the script off and just put a C on it, and straighten out the shoulders? It, it changed the font on the back, and I think you and the numbers, uh, I think you have a good jersey, but... Yeah, make sure that the five and the two aren't the same digit upside down. Yeah, the stuff like that. Like, if you made it, like, the regular Flames font and that, that yeah. and made things normal on it, basically remove some of the stupid elements like the shoulder yoke, like, just straighten it out instead of the point. Like, that... If you got that, I think that would be a good jersey. It's just... Have to wait and see. You know, uh, at each of the last handful, like ever since the 0304 jersey reveal, I think each one of the Flames jerseys since then has been quite terrible. So we'll see. And, you know, it, I'm not, I haven't been impressed with what they've done. So, you know, I'm just hoping that it's not a, another horrific <laughs> monstrosity and we'll see to be fair the 0304 jerseys wouldn't have come out if it wasn't for the horsehead jersey i mean it was the same pattern just you know different colors, oh, know. different logo so sometimes you need to go with something that's not as popular in order to you know get to where we want to be true i wouldn't be opposed to going back to the mid 90s uh, white C, the one with the black in it, and having a white C on the home jersey instead of a black C. Yeah. You'd have, to, you'd have to change up the striping patterns a little bit, but if you look at the third jersey, I think you could... You've got enough white there that you could go with a white C with a black border on it. Yeah, I'd have to see... Like, if that's what they ended up doing, I'd have to actually see it to... And I think that gives that retro nod that I think people want as well. Yeah. It'll be interesting um, one I way or the other. I like the black. I think the black adds another dimension. Um, I mean, the 80s jerseys were more orange than red. And so I like I like the red that they've been using on their modern jerseys more than the 80s color. But well, believe I, I, it or not, it is actually the exact same color. Is it? Yeah. It's just every it every Flames jersey has had the same color of red except for the Heritage Classic jersey. Huh. It's so just one of those visual things. Yeah, it's just one of those visual things mm. that if you have a darker color beside it, it makes it look darker. Well, I, I would I would be okay if they wanted to keep the black, and I like the black myself. I you know I didn't like the pedestal look of it when they unveiled it, but I like the look of the black on the jersey as an extra striping color, and it gives you that accent for pants and that sort of thing to give you something different. You're not going to wear yellow pants. Um, so I, I like that, but I'll be curious to see what they do with it. We know there won't be a third jersey next year. No teams are going to have a third jersey, just like when the RBK came in because they want you to buy the home jersey. Matt, how would you feel in 2018, 2019 if the Flames were to bring in a third jersey, but instead of going retro, they were to go with another black jersey? I would be fine with that. It would just depend on what they do with the current set and see if you can just port the black into a third jersey and it makes sense so we'll see uh, back when the horsehead jersey came out i bought one at jersey city and i did a bit of an operation on it i took a red c off the home jersey and i stuck it on the front and that was the first dark on dark that i'd ever seen for flames logos and i thought it looked really sharp and so when they took the black c on the red i really liked that as well 
So I think if they were to do something like that, a black jersey with a red C, I mean, we saw that sort of with Stockton last year. I think it could look really sharp as a third. I wouldn't want it as the home. No. I think it could look well good as a third. Yep. So. Our next show will be discussing our thoughts and reactions to this. We so. will have seen it by then. So we will be back with everyone. We're not sure the exact date, but it'll be after the draft, before free agency, and we'll profile what the Flames did at the draft and look ahead to July 1st and free agency. Um, before we go, I want to remind everyone, if you haven't yet, please take our audience survey. It helps Matt and I to know what we're doing well, what kind of stuff you guys want to see different, and what we can maybe change or do better for next year. Um, you know, we're all about making sure that what we're putting out here is what you guys want to hear. So we would love to have your feedback. And as a way to thank you for doing that, everyone who fills in the feedback and puts their name and email address at the end, you don't have to, but if you give us your name and email, we will do a draw in late July for a prize pack. And we'll post the information on what's going to be in that prize pack at firesidechat.ca. But generally, it's some flame stuff, some fireside chat stuff, T-shirts, hats, that sort of thing. So take this survey. We'd love to hear from you, and it helps us to shape the show. And, Matt, you enjoy uh, the next three weeks and what's going to be an interesting time for the league, and we'll talk to you again after the draft, both drafts, I guess. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good summer, and we'll be back soon at a time yet it's weird, to be determined ho hockey's back but it's still summer like hockey's not back but this is the most interesting time of the year for what we do yeah so we'll talk to everyone before july 1st take care this has been another fireside chat don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca follow us on facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat and to follow us on twitter at fireside podcast Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz.